While the Japanese turned to their army and its dreams of conquest as the way out of the Depression, the United States took a different road. In 1932, as the economy hit rock bottom, America elected Franklin D. Roosevelt president. First of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This nation is asking for action and action now. FDR acted swiftly. He would spend the country out of the Depression. New public works projects sprang up all over the country. Hydroelectric plants and dams to new national park facilities and scenic retreats. The Blue Eagle's loyal legions on parade. Soldier and sailor, millionaire and office boy, Society matron and shop girl, elbow to elbow in the NRA Army. While FDR's new programs offered hope, Americans turned inward as they struggled to make ends meet and avoid the bread lines. The outside world held little interest. Americans couldn't care less about Japan's imperial ambitions when the threat of destitution hung over millions of their countrymen. The issue that is first and foremost in the minds of Americans, the Depression, is what Congress is focused on. And uh, the, the idea that uh, you might want to put some of the additional very minimal uh, resources to the Pacific is just not acceptable uh, at that time. This isolationist impulse was nothing new. The end of World War I saw America become increasingly disillusioned with international affairs. Believing they had gone to war in 1917 to end the old ways of conquest and tyranny, the sanctions imposed on the central powers at Versailles in 1919 instead brought political instability, poverty, and despair to millions. While Americans enjoyed a carefree era of prosperity during most of the 20s, the United States government sought a way to make the world safe and free from war. The Washington Naval Conference and succeeding naval conferences of the 1920s and 30s, they're, they're one of the most successful examples of arms reduction in history. There's not very often that there's been a conference that results in armed forces uh, literally destroying their weapons of war. With diplomacy seemingly guaranteeing the peace, the United States felt no need to spend much on its armed forces. Few ships were built through the 1920s, and those that the Navy possessed by 1932 were obsolete. The Army was in even worse shape. Without funds to develop new weapons, its troops relied on old and outdated equipment. Few modern tanks existed, and artillery was scarce. As funds dried up, training exercises were limited to once a year combat-ready units were few and far between. The Army Air Corps, as one future World War II ace would write, was less a military organization and more a gentleman's flying club. Pilots averaged only a few hours flying time a week, and combat tactics were limited to classroom discussions. The country didn't care that its military languished. In fact, many Americans had all they could do just to survive. Times were hard at that time. Jobs were hard to get. If you did work, farm work, probably 25 cents an hour. And if you got a meal with it, you was fortunate. To those who had managed to find a job, the military appeared to be the last refuge for those men who could not find any other work. The local population didn't look too favorably on the military. It was at the end of the uh, Depression years. A lot of people were in the Army, so they could have three meals a day, be fed, clothed, and uh, have medical and dental services, and be paid besides. In the 30s, the cash-strapped American Navy lured young men with the promise of adventure and romance on distant shores. Join the Navy and see the world, became the recruiting slogan of the day.
Meanwhile, the Japanese were marching to a very different tune. As America looked inward, Japan set its sights on expansion. Faced with many of the same problems that beset the United States, the reactionaries in the Imperial Army took action on their own. To solve the country's economic problems, the Army favored expansion on the Asian mainland to acquire raw materials for its industry. Japanese troops had been stationed in resource-rich Manchuria for years, where they protected their nation's business interests. In September of 1931, a group of Imperial Army reactionaries planted a bomb on a Japanese-owned railroad line in Manchuria. When the bomb exploded, the Army blamed the Chinese and used this as an excuse to conquer all of Manchuria. Without the permission of the government, without the knowledge of the emperor or even the war ministry, Japan's Kwantung army in Manchuria was now committed to a war of aggression in East Asia. In only weeks, the Japanese had conquered most of Manchuria. The moderate government in Tokyo was horrified. Unable to stop or slow its own military, the Japanese government could not reveal to the world how weak it really was. Instead, it sent emissaries across the globe to attempt to justify their theft of Manchuria. Tokyo dispatched Yosuka Matsuoka, an American-educated graduate of the University of Oregon, to the United States, hoping his familiarity with America would help settle things with Washington. I believe, and I think, that the Manchurian question is not very well understood by your people. His comments would do anything but reconcile the United States to Japan's Asian thievery. In March of 1932, the Kwantung Army's officers created a puppet government for Manchuria, which had been renamed Manchuko. Once again, this move was done without the knowledge or approval of the Tokyo government. Faced with another fait accompli by its own military, Tokyo could only brace for more international outrage. The United States led the chorus of protests. Calls for war could be heard from some in the U.S. State Department. But in the end, Washington did nothing, other than to refuse to recognize Japan's territorial gains. It was diplomacy without any sanctions economic, let alone military. It wasn't until 1940 that the U.S. did anything about it. Emboldened, the Japanese continued their aggression in Manchuria, which led in 1933 to a rebuke from the League of Nations, condemning Japanese imperialism. I call on His Excellency, Mr. Matsuoka, Delegate of Japan. It is a matter of common knowledge that Japan's policy is fundamentally inspired by a genuine dare to guarantee peace in the Far East. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. After delivering a terse rebuttal to the League's report, Matsuoka, Japan's lead emissary to the League, withdrew the Japanese delegation. The world now understood the threat an aggressive and militaristic Japan presented. President Roosevelt was alarmed by the events in Asia, but in a country preoccupied by the Depression, few of his countrymen shared his concern. 